Good evening, everyone. I, I'm George Craw. W welcome to our lecture series. Uh, it, I, I have a note here that we've had um, over 3,000 people attend these series, and I'm really very happy with that. It's been going for for four years now, and I find that amazing because I, time passes so quickly. Tonight we have a really great speaker, Natalia, um, Batalia, who's a, a member of the Santa Cruz community uh, for long standing. Um, I have some notes here that I have to I have to read because I can't remember all all of her all of her achievements. Um, she was an investigator at the NASA James Kepler um, mission that led to so many important discoveries you may have read about. She received her PhD from UC Santa Cruz, uh, where she is now the leading uh, leading the charge on astrobiology programs. Uh, helping us to learn more about the origins and, and distributions of the universe. And I have to say, I think that, that in and of itself is just such a, a wonderful uh, achievement for, for our school. You know, it started 50 years ago. I can remember being in high school, visiting it with the trailers. And to see it now that we are become uh, one of the most important research universities, not just in California, but, but in the world, and doing things that affect, affect, affect all, 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 all people here. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. I, I, you know, when I, I was reading this earlier, I was thinking of Dean McHenry and, uh, and Clark Kerr, which is their vision that brought about the school and how happy they would be to uh, see events like this and, and see achievements like what uh, Natalie has done. But then um, let me go on to this. That she has also been uh, named a recipient of uh, many honors, including being named Time Magazine's uh, one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential opinion, uh, People, uh, Smithsonian Magazine's American Ingenuity Award. Uh, she was elected to the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, she also received the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Achievement Award, something she uh, certainly deserves. So let us welcome Natalie. Hello, everybody. Let's see, I don't need this. So I'm just going to swing it out of the way, if that's OK. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you so much for hosting this event, for giving us this event, and bringing us to Silicon Valley. It's really a, a wonderful place to share new discoveries and to bring the public along this journey of discovery that, that we have in academia. Uh, a lot has happened since I gave the Mandel Lecture last June-ish, including the fact that exoplanets took the Nobel Prize in <laughs> physics. Yes, which we didn't think could happen. Exoplanets not being fundamental physics or classically thought of as fundamental physics, we didn't think that our discoveries would ever be acknowledged in this way. Also, over the last months, we have started an astrobiology initiative at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm super proud of it and super, super happy to be there doing this great work. Um, UC Santa Cruz has a very vibrant community of people who are engaged in the search for life beyond Earth, and coming to Santa Cruz and catalyzing that effort and focusing it has been very joyful. Preparing for this talk was a little tricky because Kepler finished all those discoveries. And now I'm coming to academia and really thinking deeply about what the future of the search for life looks like and how to bring all of these people together. So I'm trying to do something a little bit different. I'm going to walk you through some of the more physical processes that I think are leading to planetary diversity. So in the title of my talk, I'm using this word plurality plurality of words, of worlds. I always thought of plurality of worlds as being one particular philosophical camp that said, there are so many planets in the universe, so many planets in the galaxy even, how could there not be life? That's the philosophical, philosophical camp, plurality of worlds. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the rare earthers. The rare earthers say, there had to be so many different coincidences that converged to create the conditions for life here on planet Earth that we don't think life is going to be very common in the galaxy. So these two camps really reside on opposite ends of the spectrum. 
But this word plurality has also taken on a new meaning for me, perhaps because it's election season. Uh, plurality also means lack of any majority. And so for me, that word has started to have the connotation of diversity. And that's really the takeaway message for this lecture, is the diversity of worlds, even when we're talking about Goldilocks planets. But the discoveries have indeed been numerous. And also since I gave the Mandel lecture last year, a very talented artist put together a sonification of the Kepler, well, of all of the data of exoplanet discoveries. By exoplanet, I mean planets orbiting stars outside of the solar system, other stars in the galaxy, hence exo. So I'll use this word a lot. So we start here with a projection of the night sky. You see the Milky Way arching through it. Um, this is the entire night sky. Um, we are going to add now planet discoveries. They're going to be color-coded by the detection technique. They're going to have a certain pitch that's proportional to the orbital period of the planet. There's going to be a certain volume that's related to the number of discoveries uh, in that time interval with, that, with those orbital periods. Um, and so I'm just going to let this play because I think it demonstrates very nicely the plurality of worlds. You want them dimmed a little bit? Can we dim the lights a little bit? thousand planets known today. I think the number is reaching something like 4,200. A couple things I hope you noticed. One, that the pace of discovery has been accelerating. The number of exoplanet discoveries has a doubling time of about 2.3 years, and we expect that doubling time to continue because there have been follow-on missions to Kepler, missions like TESS, and in the future, missions like WFIRST, which are going to continue the rapid pace of discovery. I hope you also noticed the purple footprint in the upper left-hand corner. The purple footprint was the the uh, patch of sky that was observed by the Kepler spacecraft during its first four years. Uh, so Kepler, th this is an image of Kepler's launch and the spacecraft itself in the clean room at Ball. Kepler was a space telescope, about one meter mirror one meter diameter mirror that was in a heliocentric orbit, so a spacecraft orbiting the sun, and it stared continuously at one patch of sky using the transit method of planet discovery, um, which I'm happy to describe in more detail later if you're curious. Kepler finished. It was up in space for eight years, and it discovered over its lifetime over 4,000 planets during these eight years. So most of the discoveries you saw on that previous animation were from Kepler using the transit method. It was named after the astronomer Johannes Kepler, who lived in the 1600s, did most of his science in the 1600s, came up with Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and he wrote his own epitaph, I used to measure the heavens, now I measure the shadows of Earth, which I thought was very appropriate because Kepler, the spacecraft was died, I mean, it, it ran out of fuel and operations were ceased. On November 15th, 2018, exactly the day that Kepler himself, the man, passed away. 
And uh, the transit method that Kepler employed was literally to catch the shadows that are being cast out into the galaxy by, by other planets orbiting luminous stars. So I think Kepler, the spacecraft's epitaph should read something like, I used to measure the shadows of Earth's, <laughs> plural. Um, I want to give a little bit of a flavor of what Kepler discovered briefly. It was a demographics mission, so we were taking a census of planets, um, maybe more like a poll, looking at 3,000 light years of a slice of the galaxy and then saying something about the statistics of planets in the galaxy as a whole. And we learned from that that really every pinpoint of light that you see up in the sky is not just a star, but is a planetary system. That's how common planets are in the galaxy. In fact, there are more planets than stars, is the logical conclusion. Because on average, um, every, every star has at least one planet. The Kepler spacecraft was sensitive to planets orbiting at an Earth-like orbit. We call that one astronomical unit in distance inward. We did not probe planets that are one astronomical unit and outward, nor did we have sensitivity to planets that were as small as a Mercury or even a Mars. So there's a lot of parameter space we didn't have sensitivity to, hence the at least. We were also very interested in planets that could potentially harbor life. So planets that had similar characteristics to Earth, at least in terms of the bulk properties that we could measure, which were namely the orbital period, how long it takes the planet to go around its star once, and the radius of the planet. These are the bulk properties that we measured. And in terms of those two quantities, we ended up finding a few dozen such planets they are less numerous because they're harder to find. But we can take that number and then ask ourselves the question, how many such planets are in the galaxy as, as a whole? And we could do the thought experiment of taking the Milky Way galaxy and shrinking it down to about the size of the continental United States and stand here at the shores of the Pacific Ocean looking out across the continent and say, all right, given these statistics, where is the nearest potentially habitable planet likely to be? How far away? And the answer, it turns out, is like right here at the on-ramp to 101. <laughs> It's really close. It's about a quarter of a mile on this, in, this, in this model of ours. And in cosmic terms, that translates to about 10 light years. And so I would say, to be technical, I would say that the nearest potentially habitable planet is likely to be orbiting an M-type star within, within about 10 light years, with 95% confidence. <laughs> well, why did I say M dwarf? Well, it turns out that most stars in the galaxy are actually pretty small. Um, here in this animation, we go from white to yellow to darker yellow to orange. And what I'm doing is I'm plotting the population of stars within something like 30 light years, all of the stars within 30 light years. So these are our nearest neighbors. And the white circles represent a type of star called an F star. And then the light yellow represents, or an A star, the light yellow represents an F star. The orange represent G-type stars. There are only 20 of them. And a G-type star is the type that our own sun is. So it's a member of a class of stars that's not that common. The most common type of planet is actually the M stars. These tiny red circles represent M stars that are about 10 times smaller than our sun, both in mass and in radius. About 70% of the stars in our galaxy are these M-type stars. So they're very abundant. And in fact, the nearest potentially habitable planet was indeed found around the very closest M-type star, Proxima Centauri, um, just not, not so many years ago. So one of the primary results from the Kepler mission is that every star has planets. Another result is that the number of potentially habitable planets in the galaxy is so large that they're literally next door. And that translates to something like 15 billion Goldilocks planets in our galaxy alone. Hence, plurality of worlds. Life should be common, right? Should be everywhere. 
Well, another result from Kepler is that the diversity of planets in our solar system far exceeds the diversity, I'm sorry, the diversity of planets in our galaxy far exceeds the diversity of planets in our own solar system. We have discovered many strange new worlds, literally. We have discovered planets with oceans made of lava. We have discovered planets orbiting not one but two stars. We have discovered planets the age of the galaxy itself, which we didn't think was possible because we didn't think the basic building blocks would be available. We have discovered ocean worlds. We have discovered photodisintegrating planets, planets that are literally evaporating in front of our eyes. Um, we have found planets orbiting stars in clusters, gravitationally bound clusters of, of stars, so that if you look up in the sky, you would see a bejeweled sky very different from what we see here on planet Earth. So the, the point is that there are many interesting places out there in the galaxy that we couldn't have imagined. Well, maybe George Lucas could have. Um, but. I don't think that we truly appreciated the diversity of, of planets. Many of these planets that I've just named are not potential abodes of life. You wouldn't think that a planet that has an ocean of molten lava is going to be amenable to life, and it's not. But what I'd like to say today is that I believe that even the Earth-like Goldilocks planets are going to be much more diverse than we, than we previously thought. So um, another way of showing Kepler's discoveries is in this scatter plot that I, I love. It's got so much information content in it. What I'm showing here are these two bulk properties that we measured from Kepler. We've got the radius of the planet on the y-axis, and we've got the orbital period on the x-axis. And every point that you see is a planet discovery, but this is in 2009. This is before the Kepler discoveries. This is what the scene looked like. About 85 to 90% of the planets were larger than Neptune, as, as marked here by the horizontal line. And um, fast forward four years, actually eight years, and this is what the plot looks like today. Those are the Kepler discoveries added in yellow, over 4,000 planets, and now something like 85 to 90 percent of the planets known to humans are smaller than Neptune. So the demographics have completely changed simply because we have a new had a new piece of technology with higher sensitivity to see what was actually out there. So the rest of my lecture, what I'd like to do, I'm always going to refer back to this scatter plot because this scatter plot, by measuring only two bulk properties, orbital period and radius, has a tremendous amount of information hidden in it, information that is only now starting to be fully exploited. And I'm going to try and give you a, a flavor of what I mean. And in order to do that, we have to think a little bit about how planets form in the first place. You've probably seen a cartoon like this. It's a standard cartoon of how planets form. It starts from the, the simplest of interstellar clouds, which then get shaken up and made turbulent by various mechanisms happening in the galaxy that creates tiny over-dense regions, which then start to collapse under their own gravity to form ever-denser nuclei or seeds of actual stars. And so you see the dense cloud there subjected to turbulence. It starts to collapse under its own gravity. As it collapses, that turbulence turns into bulk motion, which turns into rotation, which starts to flatten out the cloud and create these disks called accretion disks. There's a lot going on in that accretion disk, besides the fact that the central star is still contracting and under beginning the fusion of helium, of hydrogen into helium in its core, what's lurking inside the dust and unseen to us is the formation of planets. Right? All of the interesting things that happen in the universe, all of the complexity that arises is in the tiny smidge of leftovers that, that, uh, that are so rare in the universe. And so that accretion disk ends up settling down into a much simpler architecture of a central star and its, its orbiting companions, its orbiting debris, really the leftovers. It's like the little crumbs that mom didn't sweep under the carpet. Um, it's, the, it's the afterthought. 
And then I love how this diagram then circles back and shows an exploding star to give you the idea that eventually these stars shed their envelopes or, or explode altogether um, and enrich the galactic environment with new heavy elements that can then form subsequent generations of stars, of stars and planets. So the whole process is cyclic. Okay? Now, a lot of this is hand wavy but a lot of it is actually grounded in reality with observations. For example, you've seen the amazing imagery to come out of the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is the Eagle Nebula, a, a stellar nursery. We can see star formation in the act. This is the nice, the broad, diffuse cloud that is getting shaken up. You see the over-dense regions that are forming these tight nodules. Um, if you zoom into this, here's just a compendium of nodules where stars are forming. And the way that we can see these is by using infrared eyes. If you looked at this cloud, you cannot see the stars that are forming inside. In order to see them, you have to peer into the cloud with infrared eyes. and. Uh, we have telescopes now to do that, and here's a collection of snapshots of, of babies, of infant stars um, being born today, stellar embryos. Um, we can take this a step forward and ask, well, what about the disks? Here's an artist's rendering of a protoplanetary disk on the right, and on the left is an actual image of a disk orbiting the star HL Tau, a very young star. This image was taken with the ALMA array and using submillimeter um, telescopes. In my planetary astrophysics class last semester, I had people calculate what resolution was necessary to achieve this image of this star that's some hundreds of light years away, and you're seeing structures that are only maybe 10 astronomical units across these nice gaps. And it turns out when you do these calculations, the size of the telescope required to see that structure is like 12,000 meters. Have you ever heard of a telescope that's 12 kilometers across? No, but it exists. It's just not one monolithic mirror. It's a series, it's an array of telescopes, of millimeter telescopes out in the desert that work together, combining light to achieve this kind of resolution. Really amazing technology and quite new. Okay, so those are the protoplanetary disks, and you can even see some of the, of the structures that are starting to appear. What about planetary systems? In 2009, 2010, I was at a conference in Lisbon, in, or in Portugal, actually Porto. And at that, that same day, the first day of the conference, a news release was issued with a, an image of a planetary system. And it looked something like this. What are you looking at here? There's a black dot in the middle, or a black circle. That's where the central star would be, except that this instrument has removed the starlight. So there's a little symbol of a star where the star should be. And it removed the starlight so that you could see, in the glare, you could see the faint stuff around it. And from this technology, that this was taken with a Keck telescope, Keck 10-meter telescope in Hawaii, you can start to see the planets that are orbiting the star. This is an extraordinary image. The planets you're looking at are unlike anything in our own solar system. They're larger than Jupiter, and they're orbiting at great distances from their star. So this is not a solar system analog. These are easier to see. That's why we were able to do this. But this is the very first image of another solar system in motion, which I find extraordinary. We can't see that with our own solar system. We can't just fly out of the solar system and turn around and look back at our planet's orbiting, right? We're stuck inside. You'd have to fly tremendous distances to do that. So this is an extraordinary achievement, and I, I really I will always remember where I was the day that this was released. Yeah. Okay, so we see kind of from start to finish 
from molecular cloud all the way to planetary system, we see how this process is progressing, right? Um, and so now we need our theoretical models to kind of keep pace. And a lot of our theoretical models are based on what we know about our own solar system. And our thinking of our own solar system is very binary. We, in our solar system, we've got kind of like two types of planets. We've got the rocky stuff orbiting closest to the star, and we've got the ice and gas giants orbiting far away. And so we think of our own solar system in these very binary terms. And that's a problem. I'll, I'll just give you the punch right now. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more detail about planet formation, and I'm gonna take it in steps. So this first step is when you've got this accretion disk, you've got this, this material that has settled down into a disk, and you're forming chondrules. You're forming grains. Grains are starting to stick together. Molecules are starting to stick together. And that process, if you read textbooks today, it will say that they are, there are electrostatic forces that are making these molecules come together. And they kind of stick, and then they get heavy, and then they pretty much rain out and settle in the mid-plane of the disk. And now they're concentrated so they can start to clump together. Have you ever tried taking two rocks and throwing them at each other? They don't, they're not really sticky, right? They don't stick together. So uh, these objects have to become massive enough that gravity, gra the gravitational force becomes important. Ice, on the other hand, if you've ever had a snowball fight, ice does kind of stick together, right? Ice is easier, rock not so much. So that process has been poorly understood. Um, but that is the first process in our formation of planets. It's taking the molecules, the little debris, the grains, and making them come together to form these rocky cores, all right? And here's a very complicated diagram of the disk, which talks about these processes. Uh, you've got the green part in the middle where this dust has settled, and you get a concentration of dust. You've got this red part that's mostly gas. And things are different in the disk, so where a planet forms is gonna be very important. You've got cold temperatures in the outer part, hot temperatures inside. Um, all of these things matter. Even the composition of the star or the cloud that created that star and disk are going to be important. Um, now, I said electrostatic forces, but today we are able to put billions of particles into a computer algorithm and let it put in the laws of physics and let it evolve. Today, we're able to study how dust grains suspended in gas create instabilities that naturally clump things together. We don't even need electrostatic forces to do this. It happens naturally. And we see many examples of this kind of behavior occurring not just in protoplanetary disks, but also in our own atmosphere. We have hazes, we've got pollution, we have dust grains in our atmosphere that undergo these same exact processes. So the physics to study the hazes in our own atmosphere is the same physics we can apply to the disk chemistry that forms planets. All right. Now, I'm bringing all of this up because in our period radius diagram, there are features which are clues to how this process proceeds. And this slope right here, that, that pattern that you see on the left-hand side, that slope, that wall, is tracing out the sizes of the cores. So by studying exactly what those sizes are as a function of orbital period, you see it goes up as orbital period increases, we can now have a data point to tie our theoretical models together to. We can run these complex models of dust and gas and see what comes out. So that's the first stage of planet formation. Once we have our cores, the standard model says that now you can add gas. And out in the outer parts of a disk, there's a lot of gas available. Let's look at this table. In the universe, well, I'm going to separate out these compounds um, into categories. 
I've got hydrogen and helium gas in the upper left, and the black square shows the relative abundance of hydrogen and helium in the universe, or in this protostellar cloud. Most of the cloud is hydrogen and helium, not this dust that settles out and creates grains. Then we've got hydrogen compounds, like water, methane, ammonia, that's 1.4%. Then we've got minerals up here in rocks, that's only 0.4%. And then we've got the metals, heavy metals like iron, nickel, and aluminum, which is even half as abundant, 0.2%. So when we talk about the formation of these grains, we're talking about all of this tiny, very low abundance material over here. But what's really present in abundance are these hydrogen compounds like water, methane, ammonia, and then of course the hydrogen and helium gas. But you can also see in this graphic that these different molecules will condense out at different temperatures. For example, iron and nickel will condense out and form molecular grains anywhere where the temperatures are lower than 1,000 to 1,600 Kelvin. Minerals will condense out if the temperature is lower than 1,300 Kelvin. Water, methane, and ammonia is only going to condense out when the temperature is less than 150. That's an important temperature to remember. That's what we call the snow line or the ice line in our own solar system with the idea that those molecules won't exist in abundance in the envelopes of planets unless you are at an orbital distance where the temperatures drop enough for their condensation. And then hydrogen gas doesn't condense at all and it's pretty much everywhere. However, getting it to stick to a planet is going to depend on what the temperature of the environment is. And it's an important constituent. So here's our mock solar system showing all of these different metals, molecules, minerals, ices, and, and the like, and the temperature where they condense out and where the solar system planets are. And the takeaway message from this graphic is that the composition of a planet, even of its core, is thought to depend very sensitively on where the planet forms in the disk. So if we can go and measure the composition of a planet, we should be able to trace that structure, that history of a planet in this way. Um, this also means that planets that have large quantities of water ice, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen gas are only going to exist beyond the ice line where Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune reside. Do we see that in the Kepler data? Yes. Over here, there's a pileup of planets, both in the radial velocity planet discoveries, but also in the Kepler discoveries in yellow, that says when we pass a certain orbital period or distance, as we get further away from the star, that's this direction, temperatures drop and you get all of a sudden an upturn in the numbers of planets of that size. So by quantifying exactly where that happens, we will learn something about the disk chemistry and where these condensation temperatures really are, okay? But then you might ask, well, that sounds great, but what about all those pink points on the left? There's a ton of Jupiters over there. That's these here. We call these the hot Jupiters. How can you form a hot Jupiter that is abundant in hydrogen and hydrogen-rich molecules when it's so close to the star. That just contradicts everything I just said, right? And so scientists studied this and studied this for quite some time, and in fact, it turns out that theoreticians had predicted that this might be true. In fact, theoreticians from UC Santa Cruz predicted that this might be true, and they ran dynamical simulations of how planets interact with their protoplanetary disk during the formation process. So here's a dynamical simulation of, an, of a star that has 10, I think 10 planets, planetesimals. I mean, these are things, these are protoplanets. And the red that you see is the material that is still in the accretion disk. And these planets that are trying to form are feeling the gravitational effects of all of that material in that disk. 
and it's getting torqued one way and another way, and it's altering the orbits of these planets. It's changing their angular momentum. It's dragging them down, speeding them up, depending on, on what's exactly happening with the material. But the point here is that, in general, on average, these planets, through this mechanism, are losing angular momentum. Their orbits are actually changing. So if I fast forward this to the end, oops, I just want you to compare what's happening here at the end to what's happening here at the beginning. These are very wide orbits, and by the end, as it's interacting with the disk, those orbits are contracting. And so the takeaway message here is that the planets are changing their location in the disk. We take a snapshot of a star and its orbiting planet, and where we see it, the orbital period we measure it at, might not have correspondence with where it actually formed. And that confounds the situation. It, also, it makes it very difficult to understand the history of a planet and its propensity for life. We can have a planet that formed far away, like a Neptune. It migrates inward. It's experiencing a lot of heat from its parent star, and it will change its structure. And maybe today it looks like an Earth. Um, but that's not how it formed, and its composition is completely different. OK, so just to say that we see these kinds of structures that you saw in the animation, we see those in nature. Here's a, an assembly of images from also from the ALMA. Um, array, the submillimeter wavelengths, showing all of these different features that are indication that these processes are happening. So we assembled a core. How much gas we added on depends on the size of that core. We have lots of different sizes of the cores, depending on where it formed. How much gas we add on depends on the gravitational field of that planet and where it formed, and things can move around. And now we add heat. We've got heat from the parent star that is sculpting these planets. And this is also seen in the Kepler data. There's a, I call it the bird beak. There's a triangular shaped region here on the left that we call the photoevaporation valley. If a planet tries to migrate inwards in orbital period, and it tries to cross into that valley, it's going to be bombarded by radiation from its star, and two, one of two things can happen. Either the atmosphere of hydrogen and helium is stripped away, and the planet gets smaller, in which case it moves downward, or the atmosphere is heated, and it puffs up, but doesn't get stripped, and the planet moves up. So here, too, we have physical processes that are related to planet formation and the diversity of planets that are operating and causing features in this diagram. And by measuring exactly where these features are, we can gain physical insights into the processes themselves that help us to better understand the planets. Um, here's an artist's concept of what I mean by photoevaporation. There are two things going on here. One is the intense heat from the star that's actually stripping, potentially stripping the envelope. Our Earth itself was once thought to have a hydrogen envelope that has now been replaced or stripped away and replaced. Um, but also it's showing the magnetic field of the Earth. The magnetic field of the Earth is helping to shield the Earth from charged particles that are being ejected through coronal mass ejections by the sun. And those charged particles change the chemistry of the upper atmosphere in very significant ways that are important for life. So both of these processes are, are in operation and important for this photoevaporation. The story that I've built up for planet formation, the assembly of cores, adding the gas, how much gas you add depending on the core side, size, the sculpting of the envelope through heat, depending also on the core size, how well a planet can hold on to its atmosphere, but also how, where it is in relation to the star. These processes are corroborating to create two distinct populations of planets, one called super-Earths 
and one called Mini Neptunes, one which presumably removes its envelope of hydrogen and one that retains it. And this is an extremely interesting population of planets because when you look at a histogram of the Kepler discoveries, this is just a bar chart that shows the number of discoveries in different radius bins. The brown bars over here are the planets that we think of as being terrestrial planets, about terrestrial sized. The blue bars over here are the planets we think of as being ice and gas giants, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But the gray bars in between are these super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. And it turns out that they are the most populous type of planet known to humanity right now. And if you look at the top, at the solar system planets, we've got the small terrestrial things on the left, you've got the big ice and gas giants on the right, there is nothing in between in the solar system. And yet it's the most populous thing out there. So what are they? Right, just, just to go back to this. What is a super Earth? What is a mini Neptune? How do those relate to life? Can you have a planet that is four times as the mass of the Earth and to have it still have an atmosphere that's amenable to life? Is there such a thing as a planet that retains a lot of hydrogen or hydrogen-rich molecules like water to create so much water that the Earth or the planet is entirely enveloped in an ocean so thick that it's not interacting with all of the rocky material underneath which is required for complexity, for life. Maybe too much water is, is too much of a good thing, right? We're seeking the water. We look for planets that are, could have liquid water on their surfaces, but maybe too much is a bad thing. So we want to understand what these planets are. And just to, um, maybe I should have shown this diagram first, um, but this is a cutaway of the interior structure of the ice and gas giants in our own solar system, just to reinforce the point that you've got the rocky core inside, but you've got most of the radius from these molecular hydrogen, metallic hydrogen, this hydrogen envelope, an immense hydrogen envelope for a planet like Jupiter and Saturn, and even for Uranus and Neptune. The rocky core inside is thought to be about the same size as Earth. You can see Earth there in, in comparison, right? So all of the planets are thought to start with these rocky cores, albeit different sizes, slightly different compositions, um, but some are creating these envelopes and others are not. This kind of an envelope in the planetary community, planetary sciences community, is called a primordial atmosphere, meaning it was accreted on during the planet formation process in the protostellar disk or the protoplanetary disk. On Earth, as I said before, we think Earth probably did at one time have a primordial envelope as well, but it has been since stripped away, probably by radiation from our own sun, and replaced with what's called a secondary atmosphere. This is an artist's rendering of what a secondary, those processes that create a secondary atmosphere, processes like geological activity, creating outgassing, volcanoes that put CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and on Earth, of course, that story it then moves forward so that life alters the atmosphere in a very significant way, and we end up with a completely unique mix of atmospheric constituents that we see today. But all of the planets in the solar system, the terrestrial planets, barring Mercury, which doesn't have much of an atmosphere at all, have these secondary atmospheres that were either from outgassing or also potentially from collisions with maybe comets, asteroid material, that maybe brought hydrogen to create our oceans. We're not quite sure. But the point is that in this story of planet formation, I have already mentioned several key ingredients that lead to the diversity of exoplanets. So when we ask ourselves the question, which planets are similar to Earth, I almost find myself moving or migrating towards the rare Earth camps, thinking, well, 
Earth does seem to be unique. Earth does seem to have certain properties to have certain properties like a magnetic field, like the right composition that gives geological activity and plate tectonics, which regulates the temperature of our atmosphere. It has about the right radius and mass to create about the right coverage of surface liquid water. Not too much, not too little, right? Um, and yet, diversity of planets also could imply diversity of life. So who we don't really know how that's going to propagate forward in terms of the propensity for life. I think that um, the universe, the periodic table manifests itself the same way everywhere, is my guess. The periodic table is going to manifest itself and give rise to a complexity that we do observe here on Earth that's carbon-based, and that the, there's a simple path forward for life, which is this manifestation of the periodic table to produce carbon-rich molecules and water that are so important for life. But when hard-pressed and the conditions are different, who's to say that life won't find creative pathways for exploiting nature and finding ways to harness energy to do work and create complexity. So how do we move forward in this story? Well, we're about to embark on a new era of exoplanet exploration that is going to be characterized by atmospheric studies. Um, the idea is that if you can find, if you can catch light that is interacting with the atmosphere of a planet, if you can isolate that light, it will carry with it a chemical fingerprint that will allow you to understand the constituents of the atmosphere. Um, we can do that in the way that you just saw with backlit planets. These are called transiting planets. Um, just like the woman backlit, you can see her hair, a cloud shows forward scattering, and you can use that light to understand the properties of the cloud. And with a planet in the same way, this is Venus actually transiting the sun. On the left-hand side, you can see a very, very thin yellow line, which is the atmosphere of Venus. Very, very tiny, something like five kilometers compared to the entire planet. It's, it's about one two hundredth of one ten thousandth of the area of the star itself. So the light that is streaming through that atmosphere is going to carry with it a chemical fingerprint. Um, in other situations, like with the planetary system you saw in motion, you were seeing light emanating from the planet itself. In those cases, the planet was actually quite hot. So you're receiving heat. You're observing heat from the planet. Um, but in other cases, we will be able to see reflected life off of the surface of a planet. Again, here too, the light that is bouncing off of this planet is going to carry with it the chemical fingerprint of the atmosphere of that planet. And so by studying those atmospheres, we will be able to better understand does a planet have a primordial atmosphere or a secondary outgassed atmosphere? Or maybe some combination of the two. Maybe there is a continuum of planetary properties. Maybe you can have a planet that has a mixture of some remnant primordial hydrogen-rich atmosphere together with an outgassed carbon-rich atmosphere. Um, those are the kinds of things we'll be able to study. And so here's an animation that shows different chemical elements and how they burn. They each have a different color that's characteristic of the um, types of energetic transitions that are happening um, as that material burns. And by looking at the colors, you can back out what the composition of those chemicals are. And in the same way, we here's a collection of planets in our own solar system, and each planet has a little squiggly line superimposed on it. The squiggly line is just a measure of how much energy is coming from that planet as a function of different colors. So as you go from the blue side to the red side, this planet is emitting a lot of blue, not so much red. And that's what gives it its color. Um, and likewise, for the other planets, they're all in different mixtures. Earth up there is very blue as well. So it is by measuring what we, these are spectra, by measuring these spectroscopic chemical fingerprints, we should be able to back out what these planetary atmospheres are like. And the first instrument that we will be doing this with is the James Webb Space Telescope. 
Um, here is a video of Webb in its clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center. This was before shipping the Mir out to Northrop Grumman down in Southern California in Redondo Beach. Um, the telescope itself, the substrate is beryllium, very lightweight beryllium, and the mirrors are coated in gold because they're very reflective in the infrared, and this will be an infrared telescope. And part of what it will do is collect the chemical fingerprints of the atmospheres of planets. And this telescope is going to launch in 2021, so next year. So the next time I come back to give a Kral lecture, we will have information um, about the atmospheres, maybe not of an Earth-like planet, but certainly all of these exotic worlds that we've been finding with Kepler. That was a hard story to tell. You guys just heard a lot of physics. And I hand-waved a lot of it, but I, I hope that you got a sense of how complicated this planetary formation process is. It requires knowledge from every scientific discipline. We need the Earth scientists who are studying the hazes and the climate. We need planetary scientists who are modeling Mars and Venus, especially Earth's twin. We need people who are studying the giant planets. Uh, we need oceanographers to think about water and what it means to have an ocean world. Uh, we need the biologists who are going to tell us about the possibilities for life and complexity people like David Diemer, who's trying to spontaneously create RNA-like structures in the shallow thermal pools on the surface of Earth. All of these people are critical to this story, and I'm just an astronomer here trying to piece it together. Um, what this requires, the search for life is inherently dis interdisciplinary. We have to understand all of these pieces, and I'm Coming to Santa Cruz, I'm forced to really get out of my comfort zone, which is astrophysics and just detecting the planets, to really try and understand the physics and how it all comes together. And I chose to come here to Santa Cruz because we have people studying all of these different pillars of what we call astrobiology. And these people have come together over the last six months uh, eight months, I guess it's been, to create an astrobiology initiative at Santa Cruz. And we've begun talking to each other regularly. And new initiatives are already starting to emerge. For example, our astronomers who think about nucleosynthesis inside of stars and know where every heavy element is created in the galaxy are now telling us that planets can have very subtle differences in the chemical composition that can have a major impact on its internal structure. You can completely turn off plate tectonics just by dialing up or down the ratio of iron um, and nickel to magnesium, for example. You can completely turn it off. Or if you don't have enough uranium and thorium, which are radioactive elements, the inside of the Earth is not going to be subjected to high radiogenic heating, which is also going to turn off plate tectonics eventually or sooner. So all of these things matter. So having these people come together and talk to each other is leading to new pathways forward for understanding life, and this has been tremendously exciting. Um, if you want to hear more about the Astrobiology Institute, we've got some brochures here. You can come and ask me for one and talk to me. Um, but we're doing a lot of really interesting things that go beyond science. We're doing involving our colleagues in both humanities and social sciences and the arts. Uh, we are having conversations about the ethics of space exploration. Um, and we are about to host our very first public event. I can't share with you exactly the details yet because there will be a press release. But you are the first audience that I have let know that, <laughs> that coming soon, there will be a very large celebration of science that maybe is not exactly what you're thinking. It's going to involve many luminaries that are not scientists at all. 
It will tantalize your right side of your brain as well as your left side of your brain. And it's going to be at the Quarry Amphitheater on April 18th. So please mark your calendars. You're going to want to be there, I promise you. You will not be disappointed. Um, and there will be an announcement coming soon about this amazing event. Um, so I would love to leave some time for questions, and I just want to end with this figure, this image, actually, because recently, on Valentine's Day, it was the anniversary, 30-year anniversary, of the pale blue dot image, which was the brainchild of Carl Sagan. He turned around the Voyager spacecraft and from billions of miles away took a picture of Earth, and you see it there, a, a pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam because there's scattered light coming through the instrument because you're looking back at the sun. So there's a lot of scattered light. This image was recently remastered using modern digital signal processing uh, to create this new version. And it was just released a couple days before Valentine's Day in honor of the 30-year 30, 30 anniversary. And it's exactly this kind of um, data that we hope to have in the next, I don't know, 15 years, 15 to 30 years, from which we can catch the light, spread it out into its constituent colors, and be able to detect the byproducts of life that have influenced or impacted that atmosphere. So I will end there. We're preparing for that moment with the Astrobiology Institute, and I'd love to have your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think um, for the Q&A period, we've got some microphone runners. And since the event is being recorded, they want you to wait for the mic, to receive the mic before you ask your question. So I see a gentleman over here, actually. it on? Hello? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yes, I guess it's working. Um, well, thank you very much for the lecture. I was quite curious, um, with all the original gas that formed our solar system, mm -hmm. is there uh, any amount of that gas, vestigial remains, if you will, uh, left over from, uh, in, that's in our solar system, and is there are, are exploring, does that impact that gas to create something, maybe even a pebble in the, uh, in the future? Yes, so the answer to your question is yes. Is there remnant debris left over from the protoplanetary disk that formed our planets? And the answer is yes, and in fact, ranging in size from tiny particles in gas, which forms the zodiacal. We have a zodiacal emission. If you ever find yourself in a very, very dark sky, you will see not only the Milky Way arching overhead, but you can also see the very diffuse emission from our own, the, own, our, the plane of our own solar system, and that's called zodiacal emission from the remnant dust that exists. And then, of course, we've got debris like asteroids. I mean, asteroids are debris, right? These are planetesimals that were never able to form something planetary-sized and round like we think of in terms of the terrestrial planets. So there's debris of all sizes, but a lot of the gas, the, the original hydrogen that was in that cloud, has been blown away <coughs> by the radiation of the central star. And that's what actually quenches or turns off the planet accretion process. So the giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that have these big hydrogen envelopes, they had to form before that quenching, before the, the central star was luminous enough to, through radiation pressure, to blow away or get rid of, to clear all of that hydrogen. So the hydrogen gas is gone, but the dust is still there. And, and a lot of what we know about geochemistry and, and the chemistry of these systems of planet formation comes from measuring minerals inside of asteroids, meteorites, for example. Um, in fact, there's also a very interesting uh, idea that diamonds, 
Some of the very oldest rocks are diamonds, and we tend to toss away the diamonds that have impurities inside. But those impurities are trapped there from the very, very first moments of the formation of the solar system. So one man's trash is another man's treasure. So scientists are very, very interested for these, to have these diamonds that have impurities because they will extract them and they will have these pure molecules from the original moments of the formation of the solar system. And we learn a lot from measuring different isotope ratios, for example, in those minerals. Yes, in the back. So you talked about the most frequently found planets in your, the exoplanets are of a size range not representative, uh, represented in the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's actually the case in the galaxy or the universe or is possibly an artifact of our current observational technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm limited, my statistical knowledge is limited to planets down to one Earth radius. I can't say much about Mercury's and Mars-sized planets. If, if we had sensitivity to those, we might find that those are the most common type of planet in the galaxy. I don't know, I can't answer that question yet. Um, and of course, I don't measure anything beyond an Earth's orbit, more or less. Um, what I didn't show you is I can take that histogram, that bar graph that I showed you, and I can actually apply bias corrections for our sensitivity. So for example, the small planets were really hard to detect. So if I unbias my sample, those bars come up. And the giant planets are really easy to detect, so they kind of stay the same. So the relative shape of that bar graph changes as I transform it from the observed population of planets to the intrinsic population that's actually in the galaxy. When I do that, the Earth-sized planets seem to be about as common as the super-Earths in many Neptunes, which is not what I expected. And maybe it's a sensitivity bias still, because the error bars are very large. But um, I expected there to be kind of a power law behavior. As you go to smaller sizes, they become more populous, just like the stars I showed you. The stars within 30 light years. Big stars are rare, and as you go down in size, you get, they get more and more and more populous. I expected to see that for planets, and so far I haven't, I haven't, I don't have firm evidence that that's the case. So I, just to conclude, so I was very careful with my language. I said these are the most frequent planets known to humanity right now. I didn't say in the galaxy. Yeah. So um, I have a question. Please excuse my ignorance because I don't know as much as I a lot of people in this room. That's, that's um, why we're here. <laughs> but one of the questions that I have about super Earths is that in my, in my kind of amateur understanding is the larger a planet gets, many times the gravity is very strong. Do we expect that super Earths would also have a very like raised gravity or is that just kind of the wrong kind of? No, no that's exactly right. Uh, so as you go to the super Earth population, the surface gravity tends to increase. The surface gravity depends on how much mass there is and also the radius. So you can only compress rock so much, mm -hmm. right? As you double, triple, quadruple the recipe for an Earth, the radius does not double, triple, and quadruple. The planet starts to compress. And so the net result of that is that, yes, the surface gravity actually goes up quite a bit which makes it hard for detecting their atmospheres because the higher the surface gravity, the more compressed the atmosphere is too. And then that little yellow stripe that you saw around Venus becomes diminishingly small, right? So we don't like these very high surface gravities. Quick follow-on would be, wouldn't that make it harder for life? Uh, does that make it harder for life? Uh, I mean, the first question I would ask myself is, does it make it harder for the planet to harbor surface liquid water? I can't think of a reason why. Um, does it make it harder for uh, molecules to come together to create complexity like we observe? And I don't see any reason why that would be the case either. Um, but maybe you don't grow animals so large, right? 
maybe dinosaurs wouldn't exist. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my um, understanding is we have an oxygen atmosphere because plants turn yes. CO2 into oxygen. Photosynthesis. So if we find a planet somewhere that has an oxygen atmosphere, an oxygen or an atmosphere that's rich in oxygen, is that very strong evidence for life on that planet? Our best guess is that that will be a very compelling indicator, but there are false positive signatures, unfortunately. Imagine a planet that has a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, for example. Um, depending on the UV light from the central star, UV light is very good at breaking apart those molecules and separating oxygen from hydrogen. And then the hydrogen can escape because it's light okay. and it can leave behind the oxygen. So you can desiccate a planet, you can vaporize its water, put a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. It's kind of like a runaway greenhouse, if you will. Mm -hmm. You desiccate the water, put it into the atmosphere, break apart the hydrogen and oxygen, let the oxygen escape, I mean hydrogen escape, and you leave the oxygen. That oxygen was not necessarily bio, biological. So we have to be very careful. We have to understand the context in which the oxygen signal was identified. We have to understand what its star is like and what the planet's history was as well. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you, and thanks for bringing it down. <clears throat> uh, when you were talking about the large Jupiters in, on the left side of the graph, mm -hmm. I was wondering if, because the angular momentum is increasing, does that indicate an older solar system, or is that unrelated to the age of that? So, so you're referring to the hot Jupiter population that migrated inwards. Yes. Are they necessarily older? No. O older than, say, ours? Not necessarily. Oh, okay. No. The time scale for that migration is while the disk is still in place, because the change in angular momentum is due to the planet not necessarily interacting with other planets, which can also be the case in some corner circumstances. But much more common, it's the planet interacting with the disk material itself. So this is an epoch of time before the sun has cleared, before the central star has cleared the disk. So you still have a thick disk. That's when it's operating. So all of that migration happens within the first you know, hundreds of millions of years. It can already be done. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how about, yes, over here. Thank you. Um, so it seems like there's a ton of new information about all the different things that can happen in this planetary, planetary formation. And I'm wondering if it's affected your thinking and the rest of your team's thinking about the likelihood of finding life uh, compared to the way people thought maybe 20 or 30 years ago. I remember SETI at home with, the, uh, oh, yeah. with your Macintosh on the desk searching mm -hmm. for signals, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all distributed out. So ha have you, ex in, in your own career, have you seen a change in expectations? Yeah, there are three major pathways for finding evidence of life beyond Earth. One is simple solar system exploration. Although we look at all the planets in the solar system and we don't see any evidence of a living world, that is a world where, the, where you have a global biosphere, there could still be life lurking in niches, maybe in a subterranean cave on Mars or in a sub-ice layer on Europa and Enceladus. So solar system exploration still remains to be exploited. Um, the other pathway is exactly what you said, the search for, we've, it's grown, it's grown up. We don't call it intelligence anymore because that's a loaded word. We call it the search for techno-signatures. And a techno signature itself is a loaded word, but um, it speaks to some kind of engineering or building or the way we harness energy to do work or the way that we communicate. 
So those would be called technosignatures, and that's what SETI does so well, and that's what Breakthrough Initiatives is funding right now. But the third pathway, which is what you're alluding to, it only emerged recently. It only really emerged with Kepler. I, I, I'm going to say that Kepler and the 4,000 planets that were discovered by Kepler, the knowledge that the nearest potentially habitable planet is within 10 light years, and that there are 15 billion such planets in the galaxy, that catalyzed the search for life in a very tangible way. When I was the Kepler science team lead, Congress in 2017, through the NASA or the Space Authorization Act, added a 10th objective to NASA as an agency, which was the search for life, basically. So yes, I saw a very dramatic change in strategic objectives at the federal level, in universities, and also in the private sector. I, I think that the search for life on exoplanets by looking systematically at the chemical constituents of their atmospheres is the most metered way to get there. The living worlds are going to stick out like a sore thumb is my prediction. Mike. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I have two questions. <clears throat> one you didn't mention, and uh, one that you talked about. Um, <clears throat> looking for spectra of atmospheres, mm. oh, say with James Webb, or I've heard of a telescope that's even proposed after it, I think large ultraviolet infrared optical telescope or something. Louvoir, yes. Louvoir, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you're looking for the uh, chemical fingerprint, the spectra mm -hmm. of certain gases, I would guess. Mm -hmm. um, is there any smoking gun gas, or can you see a chlorophyll edge or anything like that? That's my first question. Um, is, like you said, um, oxygen could be non-biological, and right. I know on Mars, they see methane outgassing occasionally. They've seen it from the infrared telescope in Hawaii uh, several times, and I think some of the landers have detected a seasonal outgassing or maybe biological methane. Mm -hmm. So um, is there any smoking gun for life in this atmosphere that it's you could? It's a fantastic question. Um, the answer, in my opinion, is no. We will not be able to see the red edge. You're talking about the chlorophyll, the change in reflectivity due to chlorophyll in leaves and photosynthesis. It's a very tiny feature. It'd be very difficult to observe. Um, oxygen, is, as you mentioned, can have these false positive signatures. And the reality is, I guess the lesson I'm trying to drive, the point I'm trying to drive home is that we're always surprised by the diversity that we observe. So I'm very skeptical that we will be able to recognize life when we see it. And so what I'm advocating for and working hard towards through the characterization of planets with the Keck telescope, I mean, these are activities that are ongoing right now, I'm trying to curate a very broad sample of exoplanets that we will subject to atmospheric characterization because I think that we need to look at the problem statistically. I want to look at 50 exoplanets in the Goldilocks zone and see which ones are standing out like a sore thumb because I think a global biosphere is going to look statistically different from everything else. And I think that's our best hope of being able to find life. And what I'm really saying, another way to say that is, through the rigorous characterization of the atmospheres of dozens of planets, hundreds of planets, we will formulate the null hypothesis. That is, we will begin to understand what life is not. I contend that in order to understand what life is, you must understand what life is not. And that's the null hypothesis. And so that's the hard work that we're doing right now to curate a sample of planets of many different properties, to understand the bulk properties and the physical processes that are operating, and, and to get a broad picture of planet formation and diversity so that we'll be prepared, better prepared, to recognize life when we see it. OK, and the second question, you didn't mention it, but I know you know all about it. Um, one of the discoveries that was made by, well, with Kepler data, but it was actually by, I guess, um, an astronomer in Louisiana, um, Tabitha, mm -hmm. Tabby's Poi planet. Poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a very weird light curve that was not periodic, mm -hmm. and um, there was all kinds of speculation of what caused it, and I know people were going to 
take spectra during these eclipses, very irregular eclipses. Did they ever find out, or what's the best theory for what that is? The, the be so Tabby star was a star, so Kepler measured the brightnesses of stars looking for dimmings of light that occurred if a planet transit in, transited in front. And a planet is going to produce a very periodic set of dimmings of light. They're going to occur like clockwork. And they're always going to be the same. They're always going to be the same depth, the same duration. Tabby's star was a light curve that went along and then had a huge dip, came back up, went along a little ways, another kind of dip, came back up, went 700 days with nothing, and then another big dip. I mean, it was completely erratic. They weren't periodic. The depths were all different. And so the first thing you look for is a giant occulter, something that is blocking light. So you take spectra and you look for Doppler wobbles that could be indicative of a companion star, and there was nothing. No indication of a massive companion. So scientists scratched their heads and said, well, maybe it's like massive amounts of circumstellar material, like a debris disk, remnant material that's orbiting the, the, the star. And so if that's the case, you would expect to be able to observe the system in the infrared and see thermal emission due to dust. And at first they didn't see that either. But now they've gone back and they've looked more carefully and they do see a signature of dust. And the current best thinking is that the material is like some kind of precessing rings or some kind of a circumstellar material in orbit around the system. Oh, one more question. Last one, I'm told. Right there. Yeah. <clears throat> Following up on your approach, doesn't your statistical approach require, in fact, that life is fairly rare? If it turns out to be fairly common, would your, it would be the norm and not the exception? Write this down there. Um, <laughs> Well, I look around in the solar system, and that's not the case. But as we've learned, we shouldn't trust what we see in the solar system. Um, there are planets that are... We're, we're going to look at planets that are not just in the Goldilocks zone. We're going to probe the entire Goldilocks zone. And the Goldilocks zone itself, by design, by definition, is very liberal in terms of where lo liquid water can exist. At the boundaries of the Goldilocks zone, you know, you have to have really weird circumstances exist in order to really have liquid wa surface water. So I don't expect that scenario, but I would love to be surprised. Yeah, I, I, it's a good point. Oh, no, and that was supposed to be our last question. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm.